we're going to get started. All right. We should, um, let's quiet down. We should finish chapter 17 today. And maybe start chapter 18. The sooner we can start it, the better. All right, you guys, we need to quiet down. We don't want to be lecturing up until the 11th hour on Friday, right? Considering our final is on Monday. Okay. Okay, it turns out that if we look for the molecular orbital picture of benzene, we can explain its special stability. So we drew the molecular orbitals for benzene using um, Frost Circle. And Frost Circle is just an easy way to um, draw molecular orbitals for cyclic compounds. And so we put the, the uh, ring here with one of its vertices and at each juncture we have molecular orbitals at the halfway point here. We have the p orbitals before they combine to make the pi molecular orbitals. And if we have a filled bonding shell, it's especially stable. Does that mean that every time we want to figure out if something's aromatic or not, we have to draw the molecular orbitals? No. And we can actually use Huckel's rule, which is a little bit of a shorthand way of dealing with this. So Huckel's rule states any conjugated monocyclic polyene so um, that is planar and has 4n plus 2 pi electrons with n equals 0, 1, 2, et cetera, will exhibit the special stability associated with aromaticity. We're going to run through a bunch of examples so you see what I'm talking about here. Systems with 4n pi electrons are anti-aromatic, so they're less stable than their open chain counterpart. So we were right that the ring had something to do with it, um, but it, you know, there's some complications here because we have to have a ring, it has to be conjugated, and it has to be planar. Okay, so those things are all going to come into play. So to be aromatic, a compound must satisfy all four rules, and we're just going to go through all four rules here. Structure must be cyclic, that's the first rule we'll look for. Second, uh, each atom in the ring must have an unhybridized p orbital. So in other words, we have to have either sp3 or sp, we have to have our sp2 or sp hybridization. We have to have unhybridized p orbitals. The structure must be planar to allow for continuous overlap of parallel p orbitals. That's the tricky part sometimes with some of these rings. And delocalization of the pi electrons over the ring must result in lowering of electron energy. So if you have 4n plus 2 pi electrons, it's aromatic and we have special stability. Over and above anything we could have for a normal compound that's aromatic. If we have something that's anti-aromatic, it would have 4n pi electrons and that would be extreme instability. Okay, so those are the two things and then everything else is neither aromatic nor anti-aromatic, just has normal, um, normal stability. So we're going to go through each of these rules one at a time. If it satisfies a rule, we move on to the next one. If it doesn't satisfy a rule, then we, um, we stop and it's neither aromatic or anti-aromatic. To decide whether something's aromatic or anti-aromatic, we have to go through all of the, the previous rules. So let's, let's go take a look at the, um, the previous examples again now that we have this new understanding of what accounts for aromaticity. So cyclobutadiene, our, what's our first rule? Structure must be cyclic. Okay, all of these are cyclic, so let's put a little run here for rule one. All of these, we'll do them all at the same time for that. All of them are cyclic. Rule number two, each atom in the ring must have an unhybridized p orbital. All right, so for cyclobutadiene, if an atom is part of a double bond, then that means it has an unhybridized p orbital. Okay, here, so these guys, sp2, sp2, every single carbon, sp2, 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 every single carbon. So they all satisfy rule number two, which means we get to move on to rule number three. Rule number three, the structure must be planar to allow for continuous overlap of parallel p orbitals. 
And sometimes this can be difficult to decide. And, and what, I'll, what I'll tell you here is our, our rule of thumb for this class is if all of the atoms in the ring are sp2 hybridized and you have a six-membered ring or below or lower, it's planar. It's only when you get to larger rings that atoms can bend out of planarity when they're sp2 hybridized. So that's going to make it a little easier for us. All right, so number three is the, is it planar? So this is um, a four-membered ring where all the atoms are sp2 hybridized, so it is definitely planar. That means we count electrons. There's two electrons per pi bond. So there's um, uh, four um, pi electrons, which satisfies the rule of 4n pi. where n equals 1. And so there, this is one of the um, anti-aromatics. So this is extremely unstable. So this is the one we had to trap in frozen argon. And anti-aromatic. Anti-aromatic. Okay, so we know benzene's aromatic, but let's see as, as we go through where, whether it satisfies the rules. So the third rule was, um, pl is it planar? If all atoms in the ring are sp2 hybridized and it's a six-membered ring or below, it is planar. So this satisfies rule number three. And then we count electrons. There's two for every pi bond. So we have six pi electrons. And that satisfies 4n plus 2 pi electrons, where n equals 1. And so therefore, this is aromatic. Questions so far? Yeah. Whatever you need, to, yes, exactly. And it's whatever you need it to equal. So if you have an even number of electrons, it's going to satisfy one of these two equations, always. Okay, so um, even number of electrons, it'll either be 4, four um, n pi or 4 n plus 2 pi. So it's whatever one it satisfies. All right. How about cyclooctatetraene? Is it planar? We talked about this at the very first page of chapter 16. Is cyclooctatetraene planar? No, it's not planar. Not planar. Therefore, it's neither aromatic nor anti-aromatic. Remember, we need to, we need to satisfy all, the, all four rules. I mean, we need to satisfy one, two, and three, and then we count electrons. If we don't satisfy any of the, the one, two, or three, then it's neither aromatic nor anti-aromatic. So this one be this is uh, like a typical polyene. Normal reactivity of a typical polyene. All right, cyclodecapentaene. Um, is it planar? Well, gosh, the way it's drawn, it sure looks planar. Is it really planar? Here's how you know that this, this is not planar. Draw the hydrogens in on this, these carbons here. And you'll see a little problem. I can't even draw, well, they're right on top of each other. I can't even draw them. So, so this ring, when you get to larger rings, we can kind of bend out a planarity to account for problems like that. This cannot possibly be planar because those hydro hydrogens will be right on, directly on top of each other. So this is also not planar. It has the magic number, uh, 4n plus 2 pi. That's the aromatic magic number. But it, it, and if it was planar, it would be aromatic, but it is not planar. So it is, it is neither aromatic nor anti-aromatic. Again, typical polyene. 
So uh, the question always comes up, how are we supposed to decide on an exam whether these things are planar or not? Um, and, and, and the answer to that is that I will stick with six-membered ring and below, typically, so that you'll know. Because otherwise, it, it might not be obvious at all what's going on here. All right, 18 annuline. This we know is, has special stability. And, um, and you can see that, and, and so it's certainly, it's in a ring. Certainly number two, all atoms are sp2 hybridized. Um, three might not know because it's a large ring. It is planar. And if we draw the hydrogens in here, we can see that there's actually room for them. Not like in the previous example. There's definitely room for these hydrogens here. So this is planar. If we count up the electrons, we have 18 electrons. You know, and, and how do you know whether it satisfies the rule? Is it a multiple of four? 18 is not a multiple of four, so it's going to satisfy um, the 4n plus 2 pi. where n equals 4. Therefore, um, it is aromatic. So now everything on that previous slide that we were scratching our heads on is, is explained here. Okay, questions? Anybody? All right. Ionic cyclic polyenes can also be aromatic, so there's other things, ring types that we need to consider. Let's go through this. We're going to follow the same steps here. Um, step one for each of these. Uh, is it in a ring? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. That's the easiest one. Okay, number two, are all atoms in the ring sp2 hybridized? How about for this first one? No. Stop here. Okay, no. So you stop here. It's a normal polyene. It's not aromatic. It is not anti-aromatic. <coughs> all right. Now let's look again. Let's look at the second one. It, are all atoms in the ring sp2 hybridized? If I asked you that question in chapter one, you would say no, but after we did chapter 16, we realize that if this is resonance stabilized, and I'm just going to draw one resonance structure, there are many, but if this is resonance stabilized, notice once we draw the resonance structure here, that um, we started off with something that in chapter one, we would have expected this carbon to be sp3 hybridized. Now we move this over to this resonance structure, we see now there's a double bond there, so it can't be sp3 hybridized, has to be sp2. So uh, the answer to um, this one is yes, all atoms are sp2 hybridized. All atoms have an unhybridized p orbital. So, so what that means is, what that really means, and let's, I'll scroll down and then we'll scroll back up again, is, is, is this is what it looks like right here. If it wasn't resonance stabilized, this would be sp3. So in order to become um, resonance stabilized, um, there's a rehybridization that has to take place here, where that carbon starts off as sp3 but ends up as sp2. And when it goes from sp3 to sp2, it takes that lone pair and puts it in a p orbital. That p orbital notice is parallel to all of these, so we can get overlap all the way around. So this one, um, it, it gets a lot back from that little maneuver here. So we can now we overlap all the way around here. Top and bottom are overlapping here. Having fun with that pen there. Yeah, just like that. Okay, so that's what happens there. So, uh, so let's keep, let's go back. And um, so we pass rule number three. 
oh, we didn't pass rule number three. We passed rule number two. Um, what happens in rule number three? Is it planar? And what's our rule if it's if all atoms are sp2 hybridized and it's six membered ring or below, it's planar. So yes, yeah, so a check for number three. Then we count electrons. Um, so we, we have two per pi bond, and that lone pair is going into a p orbital. So we count six all together. Six is our magic number. So this is a six pi electrons that satisfies uh, four n plus two pi. Therefore, it's aromatic. Therefore, it has special stability. Now, don't get me wrong, this five-membered ring, it's an anion. It's not as stable as benzene, but it's especially stable for an anion, especially stable for an anion. Question so far? All right, what about this next one here? Uh, are all atoms in the ring um, sp2 hybridized? Yeah, carbocation is sp2 hybridized, so it has an empty p orbital. Is it planar? Yeah, it sure is. We've got our, um, so we got, well, let's, let's redo our one, two, three here. It is definitely planar because it's a six membered ring or below. And so then we count electrons. Two per double bond, four pi electrons. Okay, that's not a good one. That's uh, a four n pi electrons, where n equals one. Therefore, this is anti aromatic. Therefore, extremely unstable. Made at low temperature, trapped in, trapped in frozen argon. It's one of those, okay? So, extremely unstable, anti aromatic. Here we have a, here we have a, a seven membered ring. So, now it's going to start to get tricky whether we decide whether something's aromatic or, I mean, is whether it's planar or not. But, um, what I'll tell you for this one here is that um, all atoms certainly are sp2 hybridized. This is planar. And if we count electrons, we have six pi electrons. Six is a magic number. That is for n plus two pi electrons, where n equals one. Therefore, this is aromatic. It is, not as, it is not as stable as benzene, but is ex really stable carbocation. Okay, so very unusually stable carbocation. All right, and what I want to do is I want to take the two middle ones here. You know, we've been going through by checking the rules. You can also do the frost circle and draw the molecular orbitals. Let's, look at, let's take a look at these two here. And let's do frost circle on the next page. Just to show you that's what really what's going on here is where um, checking these rules is a shorthand way of um, doing the frost circle. So frost circle, we draw the ring uh, with our vertices down. So that's what I've done here. The halfway point, the halfway point is, is, is actually a little bit above here. It's not, it doesn't go straight through the, it doesn't go through these bonds here. It goes a little bit above. And so what we're doing here is we're combining 5P atomic orbitals. And when we do that, we get five molecular orbitals. The number has to stay the same. So there's one, two, three, four, five. So there's one on either side on the top here. Um, above this line is anti-bonding. Below this line is bonding. And what we want for aromaticity is a filled bonding shell. Yes? Not, not when there's an odd number like this. There's no way to do that, right? Yeah. Um, and that's getting like really hardcore PCAM outside the scope of this class. Okay, so this, so, so we combine the five P atomic orbitals, we get five molecular orbitals. How many electrons do we have for this one? We have four, right? 
let's fill up our um, molecular orbitals. One, two, lowest energy first, paired the spin, degenerate orbitals. We fill one each. We, do we have a filled bonding shell? Unfilled bonding shell. It's going to be anti-aromatic. All right, if we go down here, we have the same thing. Everything's exactly the same. We're combining 5p atomic orbitals. And we're only looking at the pi molecular orbitals. We're not looking at sigma. We get 5. We have 2, 4, 6 electrons. Lowest energy first, pair the spins. Degenerate orbitals get one each, and then we start to fill up. That's one, two, this is three, this is four. And now we go back and fill five and six. Filled bonding shell. Especially stable. So pretty amazing that Huckel came up with this, I think. All right, we can also, we can also extend this to heterocycles. So a heterocycle is, a heteroatom is any atom that's not carbon or hydrogen. And so like things like oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, there's a bunch of different ones. You can also have boron, there's borocycles. And we can also extend this to heterocycles. So let's look at that on the next page. Determine which of the following heterocycles are aromatic. All right, so we have, we, you already should recognize this first one. This is pyridine, right? We use that a lot in Chapter 9. This is furan. You, you, we've heard of, of THF, tetrahydrofuran. So if we hydrogenate this double bond and this double bond, that would add four hydrogens, tetrahydrofuran. So that's where that comes from. And so let's see if these guys are aromatic. So we're going to do the same, we're going to do the same steps. Step one, is everything in a ring? Yes, yes, and yes. Step two, is every atom sp2 hybridized? Certainly for pyridine it is. For and parole, well, I mean, think about it. If we want to draw resonance structures for this, which we do, if we look at that oxygen right now, um, that oxygen right now is part of a double bond, so it has to be sp2 hybridized, right? So definitely all atoms are sp2 hybridized. And, and likewise with parole, it wants to do the same thing. So with our newfound knowledge from chapter 16, we would, we would absolutely um, say that that nitrogen and that oxygen are sp2 hybridized. <coughs> all right, so we've determined that all of the, we've determined that all of these are um, sp2 hybridized. They all have rings. They're six-membered ring and below, so automatically boom, boom, boom. Okay? That's number three is, is it planar? Yes, they are all planar. Okay? And so here's what's happening here. When we do this, when we drew these resonance structures, I'll scroll down and I'll scroll back up again. Here would be the oxygen. After chapter one, we would expect sp3, but then we realize when we get to chapter 16, it can't be sp3 if it's resonance stabilized. So what that oxygen does is it puts one lone pair in a p orbital and it becomes sp2 hybridized. And, and parole does the same thing. Um, it, before the rehybridization, it's sp3. 
but it, it really greatly benefits from that resonance stabilization. It also um, is going to enable these compounds to be aromatic. So, so that's, a good, that's a good payoff. And so um, once that happens, now we have this lone pair overlapping there, just like that. Here is, here is pyridine. The lone pair is not part of that aromatic pi system. It's actually perpendicular. This is in an sp2 um, orbital. It does, not, it does not contribute to aromaticity. So we kind of have to know where the lone pairs are. So as, as you can see for um, furan, one lone pair is, is part of the, the, um, the ring and one lone pair is not. Okay, so this um, does not. Contribute to the uh, delocalized electrons in the ring. And this is important when we're starting to, when we're doing this next step, which is counting electrons, number four for all of these. So for, for, for furan um, that has two lone pairs, we're only going to count one of the lone pairs for this aromatic ring here. So this is turning out to be aromatic because it's going to be six pi electrons. And likewise here, this lone pair here is going to kick in to make six pi electrons so that's aromatic. For nitrogen, we certainly don't count that lone pair because it can't contribute to this ring system here because it's perpendicular and neither can that. So that, what that means is that for, for furan, we're only counting one of the lone pairs. So let's count electrons for pyridine. We don't count the lone pair at all. It's not involved. So this is six pi electrons, therefore aromatic. If you're in, we're only counting one lone pair. So this would also be six pi electrons, therefore aromatic. For parole, again, two, four, six, six pi electrons, therefore aromatic. Questions? So I think the heterocycles are the most tricky. But of course, um, most of you are bio majors and, and heterocycles play pr predominant, play, play a big part in the body, don't they? So that's why we need to know what's going on here with these guys. All right. Some chemical consequences of aromaticity. Yes. Pyridine? Yeah, go ahead and throw that in there. You guys want me to draw that? I love doing that with this pen. This is fun. Let's do that, yeah. How about that? Okay. All right. Chemical consequences of aromaticity. Since compounds are, some compounds are unusually acidic because their conjugate bases are aromatic. Other compounds are much less acidic than expected because deprotonation disrupts aromaticity. Also, if you're going to remove a proton um, and it's going to make the compound anti-aromatic, that, that's going to be much, much, much less acidic than normal. All right, so some things to consider. All right, so let's compare this guy here pKa of those protons versus a similar system, removing one of these protons. So what's the difference in pKa? pKa is 15 here, over here, pKa 45. So we're not just talking 30 times more acidic, we're talking 10 to the 30th times more acidic. That would be a really hard thing to explain before we cover chapter 17. 
And so let's look at the conjugate base. It's always a good idea when we're comparing acidities, look at the conjugate base. Here's our conjugate base and you'll recognize that molecule. from the previous page. This is uh, resonance stabilized. Resonance stabilized plus aromatic. So that conjugate base is much, much, much more stable than you would typically expect because of the aromaticity. And that's why it's 10 to the 30th times more acidic. Um, over here, we just have resonance stabilization. There's no aromaticity. All right, so, so, so very surprising result. Um, heterocycles have interesting acid-base properties based on the aromaticity of their conjugate acids and bases. Parole is much less basic than pyridine. All right. So let's look here. Let's draw in here. So when we're talking about basicity, we're talking about how willing is this nitrogen to donate its electrons? How willing is pyridine to donate its electrons? We know pyridine donates electrons. We saw it over and over again in chapter nine. But how about parole? Is that going to want to donate its electrons? What do you think? If it donates its electrons, it's no longer aromatic. Okay, so it's not going to want to do that. So um, pKa, conjugate acid is minus 3.8 and pKa of the conjugate acid is about 5. So that means that um, this is a much stronger base. And so the reason is, is that the lone pair is part of the aromatic pi system. So you lose aromaticity. when nitrogen is protonated. For um, pyridine, um, that lone pair is in an sp2 orbital. It's, it's perpendicular to the aromatic pi system, so it's not involved at all. Uh, no effect at all once that's protonated. The lone pair is not part of the aromatic pi system. It is uh, still aromatic after it's protonated. All right, so that helps us, knowing that about aromaticity is going to help us make good decisions about what compounds like this will do. We will come back to this in chapter um, 25 in 51C. So um, maybe flag this to come back and look at this right before we study chapter um, 25. All right, another really interesting compound um, is this compound here. It's the cycloheptatrienyl bromide and it's actually ionic. This is an ionic compound. The way we have it drawn, it doesn't look like that. It's actually ionic. And so, so the structure of this is, it's really cool because what we have here is this seven-membered ring.
And we saw on the previous page that this is aromatic. And then there's the counter ion is bromide ion. So, so much power in aromaticity that this compound, um, that bond, it, those electrons are transferred completely to the bromine so that this, ion, this compound can be ionic. So this is aromatic. It's I actually got a special name. It's called a tropilium ion. Don't need to know that. But it sounds cool. And I believe this is a really deep, deep, deep blue color. And um, so the payoff here is um, it's not aromatic in its covalent form. So some really cool, interesting things on, on acid-base chemistry based on aromaticity. Uh, we are going to skip this challenge question, okay? We might do it at the review, we might do it next week, but I'm trying to buy as much time as I can right now for chapter 18. So I'm going to slide right past that. Very briefly, we're going to talk about nomenclature. So since there's no writing on this page, well, I guess hopefully we had enough time to write that. There's some aromatic rings that you need to know the name of the ring, that we, what we use as a parent. So if a benzene ring has a methyl attached, it's toluene. If it has a nitro group attached, it's nitrobenzene. Pretty straightforward here. If it has an OCH3 attached, it's anisole. If it has an NH2 attached, it's aniline. If it has an OH attached, it's phenol. This is styrene. We saw this way back in the spectroscopy chapter. This is benzaldehyde. This is benzoic acid. And this is benzonitrile. And these are ones you just need to know the name of them. Okay? Because we're actually going to use the names in nomenclature. We talked about ortho, meta, and para when we did chapter 16. But I'll remind you, um, O for ortho means there's a one-two relationship. This is if there's two substituents on the benzene ring. Para is, this is, we can use uh, P for short. There's a one-four relationship between the two substituents. And meta, there is a um, one-three relationship, and that is meta. All right, so um, if we numbered starting from phenol, we do because that's the parent. One, two, three, four, five, six. We can use numbers or we can use um, ortho, meta, and para. So this would be ortho position, this would be meta, and this would be para. If one of the substituents can be incorporated into the name, the name is used as a parent, and that incorporated substituent is given the one position. If the benzene ring has two or more substituents, the substituents are numbered as more than two. If there's two, you can use ortho and para. If there's three groups on the benzene ring, you don't use ortho and para. You only use ortho and para when there's two, just kind of like cis and trans. We only use that if there's two, we're talking about two R groups. So this one, for example, here, um, O, ortho, bromo, phenol. Or you can write it as 2-bromophenol. Both of those are acceptable names for that compound. Uh, the second one here has three substituents, so we can't use ortho or para. This would be 2,3-dichloroaniline. Um, not ortho meta dichloro uh, ortho meta dichloro aniline okay so let's put a big x through that that's as much as we're going to get into nomenclature of benzene rings okay all right, so I'm going to save that, and we're going to start Chapter 18 today, which I'm thrilled about.
And now this is a good time to ask questions while we're saving that. Anybody? All right. It's a beautiful thing we're on the last chapter, guys. It's exciting, huh? You're, you're almost two-thirds of the way done with OCHEM. Was there a question? Where? Oh, right there. Yeah, so, yeah, so he, his question is about um, if you have larger rings, they usually will try to bend out of planarity if they're going to be anti-aromatic. We don't see too many anti-aromatic large rings because they usually can bend away so that all the, so they're not planar. So a, a ring is not going to become, if it has a choice of being planar or not planar, it's not going to be planar to be anti-aromatic. It will avoid anti-aromaticity at all costs. Because remember, all molecules are trying to get more stable. Aren't we all trying to get more stable? It's pretty true, right? OK. So we are absolutely blown away by the stability of aromatic compounds. We think up to now that they don't do anything. They do. There's a lot of reactions that they do. And that's important because a lot of drugs contain aromatic rings. A lot of important natural products contain aromatic rings. So we need to be able to do chemistry. So they do do chemistry. It's just different chemistry. So here are the reactions we're going to talk about in this chapter, in this order. So what does benzene do? Basically, the most characteristic reaction is electrophilic aromatic substitution. There, you can also do a nucleophilic aromatic substitution. We're going to talk about that next week. That's a new part of chapter, uh, a new part of this fourth edition. I will give you plenty of problems to cover that if you if you don't have the fourth edition. It's not a big deal. Um, but the most characteristic reaction is for the benzene ring to act as a nucleophile. That would be electrophilic aromatic substitution. Why do I keep doing the same thing? OK. These guys are the electrophiles. So our generic electrophile E plus. So what happens when we do bromine and FeBr3? That is a bromination. So we're using, the same, we're using the same word, but we're not getting the same product that we got from chapter 10. OK, there's nitration. So we're going to be able to do nitration. We're going to do sulfonation. So this is something pretty new. We're also going to do Friedel-Crafts alkylation and Friedel-Crafts acylation. There's Friedel-Crafts alkylation, and then we have Friedel-Crafts acylation. So we have, um, out of a possible, let's see, how many do we have here? Five. Uh, one of these mechanisms will be on the final. They're, all, they're very similar. Um, the only thing that's different is when we make the, in, the electrophile. After we make the electrophile, the rest of the reaction is the same. So it's really not going to be that bad. So guaranteed to have one of these guys on the final mechanism. All right. Let's do a little review here. Chlorination and bromination of benzene in chapter 10. All right, so we made the, we made the 1, 2 dibromo compound, didn't we? We remember that. And that was electrophilic addition. via a bromonium ion. If you have no idea what a bromonium ion is, you, you crammed everything the day before um, midterm two. And it's all gone. Okay, so that's chapter 10. 
Now, do we do the same thing with benzene? No. Why not? You'll tell me why. No, electrophilic addition. <coughs> Why don't we get electrophilic addition? It makes it, it makes it's the aromaticity is gone. It's not anti aromatic, it's just not aromatic. Aromaticity is gone if we did that reaction. There's no reason for that reaction to happen. It's an uphill reaction. And so what we do instead is electrophilic aromatic substitution. So they share one word in common. That's the only thing that's the same. That's better. That's a much better product because we're still aromatic. Our side product, which we never worry about except for the first time we do a reaction, is HBr. And this is um, electrophilic aromatic substitution not electrophilic addition. All right, so we're going to do the mechanism. We're going to do the mechanism for all the reactions on the, on the front page that we just had. And then we're going to talk about some, wow, there's a lot more to this reaction than that. I mean, these reactions than that. So uh, for the mechanism here, the first step is to make the electrophile. So bromine on its own is not electrophilic enough. So we have to kind of soup it up to make it more electrophilic. Why do we have to soup it up? Benzene's so stable, right? It, why is it going to react if it's not souped up? So we got to do that. So here's what we're going to do. We add a Lewis acid. Iron um, would like to very much like to have uh, eight electrons in its valence shell. So it's a, it's a nice Lewis acid. So we'd get a Lewis acid base reaction. There will be a negative charge on iron. There will be a positive charge on bromine. And, and what that does for us is it polarizes this bond. Okay, it really polarizes this bond. So it makes it more electrophilic when we do that. So it um, polarizes this bond. and makes it more electrophilic. All right, in the second step, benzene attacks the electrophile to make a resonance stabilized carbocation. This will be the same for all of the five reactions on the previous page. This will be the same. The third step, will, the third part of the, the phase of the reaction will be the same. So the only difference is going to be this part. So there's, it's really not as much as you think it is. So um, so let's draw this guy. All right, so this is going to come and it's going to attack the bromine. We're going to break the bromine bromine bond. This is the slow redetermining step. We are breaking aromaticity and making a carbocation, so it makes absolutely good sense that this is the rate determining step. So, just like electrophilic additions from chapter 10, one side gets the positive charge and one side gets the bromine.
And when I put the bromine on, I usually put a hydrogen on that, on that carbon to show so I don't accidentally make, a, a, make bad resonance structures. Okay, so we're gonna draw, we can draw three resonance structures here. So we're doing terrible things, we're breaking aromaticity, we're making a carbocation, but it's not as bad as it could be because we do have a resonance stabilized carbocation here. So that's helping. So three nice resonance structures. Resonance stabilized carbocation. And in the last step, step we're going to regenerate the aromatic ring um, you, by using and doing an E1 reaction. Um, we'll do that next time. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Try to figure out what that's going to be yourself.